Uh, our occasional series, The Joy of Hymns, uh, will uh, be led this morning by uh, Dr. Telford Work uh, and uh, Dr. Steve Hobson on, uh, on the organ. It's Joy to the World, and uh, Telford's going to tell us about what he, th in a moment, Telford, but come on up, come on up. It's good, I like that. No, that's out of the blocks. Okay, but before, af after Telford speaks, uh, I want you to, uh, I want to introduce our speaker, because she'll come up right after he's done. Uh, Noemi Chavez. She co-pastors uh, the Seven Seat Church in Long Beach with her husband, Joshua. Uh, she was with us last February. We loved having you here, Noemi. We're glad you're back. Uh, she is the mother of two awesome children, and she has a passion uh, to see Latinos raised up in leadership in the church and uh, the next generation uh, grabbing hold and uh, leading us. Uh, so, Noemi, we welcome you in the name of Christ, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing, you, hearing from you after we hear about Joy to the World. Telford. Thank you, Ben. Sorry, I jumped the gun. So, Joy to the World is the most popular American Christmas carol, the most widely published one which is rather ironic because it's not a Christmas carol, at least not the way a lot of people think of it. Uh, look at that first line. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. We don't talk like that nowadays. Uh, but in Old English, is come is the way you would say has come. All right, joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Imagine the President of the United States knocking on your door at home. You would probably open the door and give a respectful welcome, even if the President's not from your political party. Right? Let Earth receive her king. So to help, to help make this clear, I'm colorizing this hymn with apologies to Ted Turner. Um, next slide, so thanks. No, one back. There we go. There are two uh, lines in the first two stanzas that are in the indicative mood. I hope some New Testament professors are hearing that I'm using language like this in chapel. The indicative mood is about what is, right? So look at what Isaac Watts, hymn writer, wants us to fix on. The Lord is come. And in the second stanza, stanza the, the Savior reigns. And the question is, now what are we going to do? Now that Christmas has happened, in light of what God has done, how should we behave? New Testament's full of this kind of thing. The indicative imperative, right? Here's how it is now. Here's how it ought to be. So next, thanks, perfect. So I've put, I put in green the indicatives, this is what's good, what's already happened, and I'm putting in red what we ought to do, commands. Rather Christmassy, don't you think, ironically. So since the Lord has come, let there be joy to the world. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room, and also heaven and nature sing. Um, what will we do in our hearts, in our lives, in light of Jesus' coming? That is really what this, that's the question, that's the command that this hymn poses for us. It's actually, um, it's actually a meditation on Psalm 98. It's the second half of Psalm 98. And that explains the second stanza. Joy to the earth. Because the Savior reigns, so let's use our songs while nature repeats the sounding joy. That's right out of Psalm 98. And then third and fourth stanzas next. Just, I, I like proclaiming these ahead of time so that we won't just sing the words, but we'll listen and hear it and really mean it when we sing. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. We've just heard that nature repeats the sounding joy. So now, in my life, let us 
No more let sins and sorrows grow. Why? Because he comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. And again, in the indicative, he rules the world now, today, ascended at the right hand of the Father. This is not about expecting the first coming. This is about enjoying the first coming and expecting the last coming. He rules the world with truth and grace. And he makes the nations prove, and I'm cheating here, this is all in the indicative, but it's now ours to prove the glories of his righteousness, right? To prove out the reality of his reign. This is a wonderful hymn. I hope you listen as you sing, and I hope you sing it with all your might. Good morning. So happy to be with you guys and honored to um, be a part of this morning chapel with you guys. You guys look great. How's, how's it going? How's the year coming along? You guys excited that it's almost over? Come on. I remember those years and I remember that time. So this morning, I, I just hope that um, what we share would bring some refreshing to your spirit and your heart. And uh, we're going to share on just the idea of follow me to Bethlehem. So for those of you who want a little glimpse of what my world looks like, this is the church that we pastor in Long Beach. And, um, you know, Bethlehem is a beautiful place, and the story of Jesus and his birth are so powerful because it changes everything in the history uh, of humanity and of our lives and who we are today. And Bethlehem is a place where we find three things that I want to share with you this morning that maybe can encourage you as you close out this year, but also as you uh, begin to think and enjoy uh, time with your family and friends or people just in your community here at Westmont, and we look at Christmas time. Uh, three things I, wanna, I want us to focus on this morning. The first one is, is that Bethlehem is the place where hope is found. And although obviously we are not going to go to the Middle East and find ourselves in the place of Bethlehem, this morning I would like to suggest that Bethlehem is the place where we engage and we come together and where we find the hope of Jesus in every place that we might find ourselves in, whether it's in chapel this morning, whether it's in our local churches, in our communities, at coffee time. You know, Bethlehem, the place where Christ is born, the most inopportune, unexpected, maybe um, not the place that you would expect to find Jesus. How many of us have found ourselves in conversations or in circumstances that we think, how did we end up talking about God here? And it's because you create a space where Jesus comes to offer hope. And so hope is a beautiful word because hope says that there's anticipation and expectation in our hearts for something better for something greater, for something that will offer a light maybe in the midst of uh, difficulty or, or hard or, or dark circumstances, hope offers a light. And in the scripture, we see the story of, um, of Simeon. In Luke chapter 2, he talks about uh, how he is waiting for the consolation of Israel. And as Simeon is waiting for the consolation of Israel, there's an expectancy in his heart that he knew he would see the Messiah before he dies. Now, I love this part of the story because Simeon is not somebody who is in power or in authority amongst the people of Israel. He is a devout man. And isn't it beautiful that God would give somebody who not necessarily has this great deal of power or this large um, title the opportunity to experience something that is so simple yet so profound and so powerful. So the Bible says that baby Jesus is taken to the temple by his mom and dad, by Mary and Joseph. And when Simeon holds the baby, he realizes two things. First of all, he realizes that this baby that is in his arm, it, arms is the consolation of Israel. It, it is the answer and it is the hope fulfilled in his life that God had given him. But he also realizes in that hope, listen closely, that as he holds this baby, he says something to Mary that is really a, a key to me. He, he says to Mary, hey, Mary, you know, this baby, although he will be a revelation to the Gentiles and he will be a glory to Israel, this, this baby's life, what he will live through will pierce your soul, Mary. It will cause great pain. Because Simeon was aware of the fact that this same baby Jesus that would be a revelation to Gentiles and the same baby Jesus that, that would be the glory of Israel 
was the baby Jesus that Isaiah spoke about. And, and because he knows the great things about this baby, he also knows what this baby will have to endure in order to bring forth the redemption of all mankind. So what's beautiful about this moment in Simeon's life is that he holds on to hope for God's promise. And when he holds on with that expectancy that God is going to fulfill his word, he also realizes that as he waits for that hope and he holds that baby in his arms, he is experiencing also the redemption of our stories. So how beautiful is it that, that Christmas not only brings to light the birth of Jesus, but it is also his death. And so in his death, we are included. In his death, um, our stories are redeemed. Our lives are empowered because then through Jesus, it is that we have full access to God the Father. And so as we look at what hope means to us, I don't know what maybe you might be facing this morning or what your week has looked like or what next week is going to look like, right? Can I just tell you that you have the God of hope in your life and that in the middle of the tension of I know this can get better, you have a God who redeems and a God who offers grace and a God who will strengthen you. You know, the book of Timothy says that, that God is faithful, that Jesus is faithful even when we are faithless. We have a hope that he never gives up on us. His love is eternal. As a matter of fact, it says in the scripture that he is so faithful that he cannot deny himself. He cannot stop being faithful to you. I don't know about you, but that gives me hope this morning. That even when I'm in um, the worst place in my heart or in my mind, that God's love is faithful. That he doesn't give up on me. Now as we observe Bethlehem and the beauty of that place where promise is fulfilled, we know that we, all, we find hope in Jesus, but we also know that he is the God that fulfills promises. And his people were awaiting for this promise to come to pass. And one of my favorite scriptures in Christmas time is found in Luke chapter 2. And, and I want us to read this together as, as you can follow on the screen or wherever it is that maybe you like to read scripture. Maybe it's on your phone or your Bible. Luke 2 says, And there were in the shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. I think you'd be terrified too if in the middle of doing what you do on a daily living, an angel appears to you. So it, it's, it's a real feeling, right? It's a real emotion that these guys are feeling. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company, I mean as if one angel wasn't terrifying enough, right? Thank you, God. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off. Can you say that with me this morning? They hurried off. Here, here's, the, here's the key for us. You find yourself in the place where you know that there is promise for your life. The scripture is filled with promises. Um, so they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So this, this is really great for us because it gives us an actual action plan for us. You find yourself doing everything that you're doing in life to see your dreams fulfilled, your goals. You are here, you're going to school. Some of you are, are doing so many things and engaging on so many levels. But, you know, there, there are promises for our lives that we will only find fulfilled when we are in the presence of Jesus. And the only way that we're going to get to the presence of Jesus is if we hurry to it. Yes? If we run to him. 
And if we know the truth of God's word for us and we have an understanding of what his promises are for us, we could live with that understanding and do absolutely nothing with it. We have full access to a loving, empowering, gracious Father, and we could have all this understanding but do absolutely nothing with the fact that he wants to be present in our lives. And the way that he is present is through his promises, and the way that we engage is by going to him. And so I love that the shepherds don't kind of like, yeah, you know what, we're kind of in the middle of something right now. Angels, thank you for the suggestion about this Jesus guy. We appreciate it, and this is great news for our people. But we're going to camp out here when we have some more time, you know, in our busyness. We're going to get to being where he is. No, no, they decide that very moment, they hurry off. How many of you can agree with me that there are just times in our lives when we are doing things that we feel we need to do, but then we encounter these moments where God reveals and reminds us who he is, and we know that all we need to do is run to the presence of God. And running to the presence of God doesn't necessarily only go into church, right? Or, or maybe a Bible study. Running to the presence of God sometimes means um, making the space in your dorm or in your car or on your walk where you invite Jesus and you say, God, you are the God that fulfills promises. Jesus, you are the one who is the hope I need, and you are the God who fulfills promises. But I will run to you, God. I will run to you because I know that on my own power and in my own understanding, unless I am in the presence of your goodness and your faithfulness, I will not see heaven touch earth in my life. And so, so many times we become complacent with knowing about who he is and that he was born. But there are moments in our lives where we have to run to his presence and create the space, whether it's getting on our knees, whether it's shutting our eyes, whether it's opening up his word, where we say, God, what do you have to say to me right now? Because it seems that my life is full with things that I need to do, but how can I make space so that your peace can inundate this moment so that my fears are then going to be shunned or they're going to be dimmed in the light of your presence. Because when we are in the presence of Jesus, things begin to change. When we live understanding that he is king. You know what's beautiful about that scene is that these shepherds run to him. They, they run. I mean, I just wonder what Mary and Joseph must have been feeling, you know? Like, these are two young people with a baby who is the son of God. Like, they were not, like, in their 30s and really mature like me, you know? They were young. They were young people with this huge assignment in their lives. I mean, this is, like, not just any little thing. Like, this is massive. Like, this is life and world-changing. And for them to be in that place where they're with the baby and these Shepherds show up and they begin to say the declarations that now we know what you know. I mean, what a relief for Mary and Joseph. You know, I, I can imagine if they were not like, yes, thank you. I'm glad you understand. They were like, oh, my goodness, they know too. We're so glad somebody else knows that this baby is the son of God. Like, this is great news. This is great news that we are not the only ones that know that he fulfills promises. And some of you know the promises that God has for your life and for your future. But you haven't taken a hold of them. And so this morning, I want to encourage you to run to Jesus. To hurry, to, to get yourself into the place where you are in his presence. And that looks very different for every one of us. For me, for me sometimes it means going for a drive. Sometimes it means, you know, um, going for a walk. Sometimes it means going to the gym. Like, I'm going to find my space with God where I get to hear some music or I get to hear the word or I get to be alone. And so what does that space look like where you run to the presence of Jesus, where you see promises fulfilled? You know, the last thing that I want to share with you this morning is as you go to Bethlehem. You know, Bethlehem, like I said earlier, is not just the place where you experience church. It's not just the place where you gather. Bethlehem is here. Because you know what? In this place this morning, you, you can experience God's promises being fulfilled in your life. This morning, you could experience finding hope. 
So yes, this is the place of Bethlehem. This is the place where Jesus is. But it is also the place where, where love is born. The love of God is born in that place. And guess what? Bethlehem also means your conversations. Bethlehem means that when you engage with other people, with friends, with uh, family members, with just the community that you are in, if, if some of you have jobs, in the places where you work, where, wherever you are, when you invite Jesus into that conversation, when you invite hope, when you invite promise, then, then guess what? The place where we allow God to be present, it is where love is born. And how many of you know that God's love it is, it's just uncomprehendable. We can't understand why he would love us so much. Why he would give up everything that was perfect and pure in heaven. And he would come because he wanted to be in relationship with us so much. You know, what's incredible about God is that from the beginning, he never intended to have relationship with us through anybody else. He wanted relationship to be directly with us. Clearly, just you and God. And that's what Jesus came to do because God's love for us is so intense. It's so real. It's so powerful that in that moment in Bethlehem when, when love is born. And I want to just kind of allude maybe to, to the book of Corinthians because it describes a love that sometimes we strive so hard to, to have that kind of love. But the manger scene and that moment in Bethlehem are a clear definition of what that love looks like, a clear expression of that love. And, you know, in, in 1 Corinthians 13, it says that love is long-suffering, it is kind, it does not envy, it does not parade itself, it is not puffed up, it does not behave rudely, it does not seek its own, it is, it is not easily provoked, it thinks no evil, it does not rejoice in iniquity, but love rejoices in truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So when we see this description of love, is this, is this not the love of God the Father towards us in the birth of Jesus? A perfect love, an untainted love, an unenvious, a love that doesn't withhold. Uh, do you know that God does not withhold what is good for your life? What we need to understand is the way that we have access to that beautiful love and that powerful strength that comes from God is when we do what, this, what those shepherds did. When we take what we know and we run to his presence, there's just something powerful that takes place, guys, when, when we know something here, but it makes a connection here. When we don't just have all this information of who God is, but have no experience of what it is to to live in his presence, to enjoy the peace of his goodness. And so the place of Bethlehem in our world looks like those conversations. I'm wondering how many of you are in a good place where you're like, yeah, you know, I get it. I experienced that. I know the presence of Jesus. I know his love. I know the beauty of having hope in his redemption and his cross and his love and his power for me. But, but I'm wondering, even in the busyness of this season, as you're going to go into times of finals, I, I wonder if there's any students around you who find themselves in the place where, where they need some hope, where they're doubting that any of God's promises are for them, where they feel that there's not enough love in their tank. And I'm wondering if in the middle of your very full and very busy season, you would allow yourself to be the place of Bethlehem in their life. Where you say, I will engage in friendship with you. I will pray with you. I will uplift you so that you would know that, that the Jesus that we serve, he is where we find hope. He is also the one that will fulfill his promises to you. Some of your friends need you to encourage them. So will you be courageous enough to allow your life to carry this gift? Will you be the one that is an expression of God's love in the midst of maybe some turmoil and difficulty and stress? In the midst of having to face this season with, you know, we in this season, I, I'm saying we like I'm still in college. You know, but in the season of my college years, I remember going through heartache and, and you know, some issues in my heart and some things that I was conflicted about and, and it was those people who held my hand 
the people who believed in God's goodness for me. So this morning, I'd like to maybe challenge you if you are in a place where you know who Jesus is in your life, where you are a continuous, just committed individual who loves to be in his presence, and you know how rich and how good it is to run to him when you find yourself, and you know how great it feels to be surrounded and just enveloped by his love, and, and I would encourage you, because there were moments that I was stronger than others, and my assignment in that season, despite how crazy busy I was, was to love on my friend, to, to love on that dorm roommate, and the one who's across the hall or my classmate or my coworker, would you allow yourself in this Christmas to be that expression where your life leads people to the manger scene, where your hope and your faith brings an understanding of the greatness of your creator and the love that he had as he expressed it through the birth of Jesus. So would you pray with me this morning? Would you pray and believe with me and say, God, maybe you're in the place where you need it, but maybe just maybe you're in the place where you're saying, not only do I need it, not only have I experienced it, not only have I received it, but I know that there are people around me that God has put in my lane, and I am responsible for praying for them and uplifting them. Father, we thank you, God. Lord, we thank you this morning that you are mindful of, of this very day, that you are mindful of this season, that as we celebrate your birth and the power of your resurrection, that as we acknowledge that in that baby Jesus there is hope, but there is also redemption, that as we await, Father God, your goodness and your faithfulness, that we would also respond to the assignments that you put in our lives in this season, the friends, the people, that you are trusting us with. Lord, that we would lead them to that place of Bethlehem where, where we see heaven touching earth, where we see promises fulfilled, where we see God unwrap the gift of love for all humanity, that love is available to all of us, that faithful, unending, unquestionable love, the love that is always present, that love that is persistent, that love that chases after us even when we reject you. Jesus, would we allow you this morning, would we allow you to use our lives to be the place where love is born, a love that offers hope to others? And Father, we just pray for every student that is here this morning, every faculty member, that as this year comes to an end, we pray strength and peace, Lord. God, we pray wisdom and understanding, Lord. Father, we pray, God, that you would be present in every aspect of the rest of this day and throughout the rest of this semester. That we not lean on our own strength and understanding, but that we would lean on you. And that you would lead our steps, Father. God, I just pray, Lord, for discernment and I pray, Lord, for direction for every one of these students, Lord, that they would understand their value and your love and your perfect, perfect love that will sustain them as they face, Father God, this coming week. God, we thank you that in all things we will give you glory. God, we thank you that in all things we will give you praise and that your name be lifted up. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. You are dismissed.